This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome one and all to our virtual worship service. I do hope that this service is meaningful to you and uplifting for you. I ask your prayers for all of us gathered here today, Kid, Bill, Ryan, Jordan, Kim, and myself, as we do our best to lead this service. And also keep on praying for all of those people known by you who especially need our prayers this day, including those folks listed on our e-news communication. I would remind you and continue to urge you to keep on giving to this church as you are able. We depend upon you and your generosity. And I would also remind you to contact Kip or myself if you have particular pastoral care concerns outside those being so ably taken care of by Susan Smith, our Congregational Care Committee led by Levina Kohler, and our PW Circles. So without further ado, let us worship God.
strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt. May we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Sunday in the season of Easter is the 16th Psalm, Psalm 16. Listen now for the Word of God as written by the psalmist. 
protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures evermore. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Else. 
So let's just see. We put that in there, and now we're going to add all the fun stuff, right? This is family. Sometimes you probably have some chores that you have to do. Right now, I know you don't like it, but you've got schoolwork that you have to do. We've got to get all of that done. We put them in there, we put them on top, we work on it, we are obedient to our parents, we get everything done that we're supposed to do. And I think I have most of these in there. And then, I still have room, look at that. I still have room. So now, I've got fun things I can do, right? I can still do my video games, I can still Zoom with my friends. I can still watch my favorite television show. Don't worry, I have time to go outside and play. It's still fitting in there, can you believe it? I have more room, let's put more in there. I almost have everything in there that I started with. And you're not going to believe it, but because I put God first, I have room left over. I have room for more fun and more family and more chores. Maybe that's not your best thing. But I have room left over. So that was a fun way with our imagination. But what I want you to remember is don't put God last. Put God first. I know we tell you this. And I know it's hard for you to believe, so I hope we showed you a little bit about when God is first, there is room for everything. So don't forget, while you're home and you can't come to church, you can still be with God and have time with God. Let's say a quick prayer. God, we thank you for the words in the Bible that teach us and help us learn how to live. Help us to know you and to trust you and to make you more important than ourselves. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand and his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that through believing, 
you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whistling in the Dark. Whistling in the Dark is the title of a wonderful little book by Frederick Buechner, in which he writes short vignettes based upon everyday words, and then he connects those words to an everyday faith. In the introduction to the book, Buechner writes this, and I quote, I think of faith as a kind of whistling in the dark because in much the same way, it helps to give us courage and to hold shadows at bay. To whistle in the dark isn't to pretend that the dark doesn't scare the living daylights out of us. Instead, I think, it's to demonstrate, if only to ourselves, that not even the dark can quite overcome our trust in the ultimate triumph of the living light." Unquote. Well, we have just experienced another celebration of the ultimate triumph of the living light, have we not, in the resurrection of Jesus as the Christ, as unusual as that celebration had to be. But hopefully that unusualness has not dampened your faith or your hope or your love or your determination to carry on the work of Jesus the Christ in this world and in this church. The story of Easter is why we even have a church. The story of Easter is a powerful and life-changing story. Without Easter, it is highly unlikely that the church would have ever gotten off the ground. The resurrection of Jesus as the Christ is the reason for the church. But now the fun begins. What happens after Easter morning? For it is not the empty tomb, of course, that gives proof of the resurrection of Jesus as the Christ. Rather, in the story of the church, it is the appearances, as it were, of the risen Christ that make all the difference. Without appearances, we are left with an empty tomb, which emptiness could have any number of explanations. Today, we'll take a look at one of those stories, the one in today's lectionary text from the Gospel of John that I just read for you. I think this story is a particularly moving story of the appearance of the risen Christ. It's a story of faith. Faith is a kind of whistling in the dark. For the moment, the disciples in the story don't seem to be whistling or anything else. The story tells us that they are in the dark, as it were, in a locked house, afraid of all that has happened on Easter Day. But then Jesus enters, apparently through the locked doors of the house, stands among the disciples, says, Peace be with you, then shows them his hands and his feet. Right away, we ought to notice the nature of this appearance, this appearance of Jesus. That is, somehow this is an embodied Jesus, but different, able to go through locked doors. To me, this body of Jesus is a manifestation of what the Apostle Paul calls a spiritual body in the 15th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthian church. If there is a physical body, there's also a spiritual body, writes Paul. I will tell you a mystery, he continues. We will not all die, but we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. I think this is the kind of thing the disciples experience in our story from John. This is the real Jesus, but changed. A new manifestation of the Jesus who walked on earth before his death and resurrection. This Jesus who walks through locked doors is now Jesus as the risen Christ. Fully human and fully divine, a concept that is part of our Christian confession of faith. Note also that neither the disciples here at this point nor 
Thomas in the second encounter in our story actually touched Jesus. They look, but they don't touch, at least as far as we can know from the story. You may remember the Easter story that precedes this one about Jesus in the garden with Mary. Jesus had specifically told Mary Magdalene not to touch him. At this point in our story, Jesus greets this, the disciples again. Peace, peace be with you. And then he adds, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. In other words, the disciples are to carry on the work of Jesus in the world and in the church. The way of Jesus is to become the way of all who follow him. And the power to do so comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit. Jesus' giving of the Holy Spirit by breathing on his disciples is John's version of Pentecost. That story in Acts chapter 2 in which there comes a sound like the rush of the violent wind and the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. Breath, wind, and spirit. All translations of that Greek word Numa, about which I wrote in my devotion a couple weeks ago. Note that this John Pentecost occurs on the very day of resurrection. In other words, this Holy Spirit is a very present thing, not something for which we must wait. The life of the disciple then and now is powered by the real presence of the Holy Spirit within it. Jesus then emphasizes the centrality of forgiveness in the life of a disciple. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained, says Jesus. In other words, forgiveness is up to us. God had already forgiven unconditionally on the cross. Forgive them. For they know not what they do, Jesus prays from the cross. Now it's up to us. If we can't do it, then an endless cycle of unforgiveness and violence and vengeance in the world will go on. In other words, those sins are retained. Please take note that Forgiving sins or retaining sins is not for the purpose of giving us some kind of holy power or deciding who gets forgiven and who does not. No, this is about our responsibility, our commandment even, to forgive. It's the only way in the kingdom of God. It's the way of peace. Next in our gospel story, we have the story of the so-called Doubting Thomas. Well, this is essentially a repeat of the first encounter of the disciples with Jesus. Jesus again invites touch, but the story does not say Thomas does so, only that Thomas believes. He sees and believes. And then Jesus says, for all who follow in the history of the church, including you and myself, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is us whistling in the dark because we do not actually see Jesus, but we believe. We believe when we have been awakened to the real presence and power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Belief, faith, is not something we decide to do. It is something the indwelling Holy Spirit does to us. We respond to this holy awakening by seeing the risen Christ. Believing is seeing. And we believe because God has awakened us to do so. Finally, we have the real kicker in the Gospel of John. Verses 30 to 31 relate the whole purpose of the Gospel. The purpose for the early disciples and the purpose for us contemporary disciples. As the author writes this, Now Jesus did, did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written 
so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Every time you read the Gospel of John, I encourage you to keep this purpose in mind. Everything in the Gospel points to this purpose. Belief, faith, and eternal life. Eternal life right now. Not in the dim, misty recesses of the past, not in some unknown time in the future, but right now. I am the resurrection and the life, says Jesus in an earlier story. It is so important to understand the real presence of eternal life here and now in the risen Christ who lives in you and in me as the Holy Spirit. This is what makes us whistle. Eternal life here and now enables us to whistle in the dark, trusting the ultimate triumph of the living life, as Frederick Beekner puts it, even through the dark times of today, including, of course, this hideous coronavirus that sometimes scares the daylights out of us. But no matter what happens in life, I encourage you to keep on whistling. Whistle while you work, as it were. Doing your best to be faithful disciples. Learn from and emulate these first disciples in our gospel story and receive the peace that Jesus offers. Receive the Holy Spirit. Practice forgiveness. Keep on keeping on, even in the face of doubt. There's always doubt in the midst of a strong, seeking faith. Beekner calls doubt the ants in the pants of faith. Cling to the assurance of a faith that is stronger than the ants. Cling to blessed assurance. This is your story. This is your song. This is the object of your whistle. So whistle in the face of hardship and suffering and poverty and injustice and violence and evil. Whistle when you worry and wait and face the unknown. Whistle when you fret over past actions or words. Whistle in the midst of anxiety in your everyday life. Whistle in the dark, for the light has come. And nothing can ever separate us from the light. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us pray. God of light, God of love, we pray for the will to awaken to the presence and power of your love in us. The strength to transform our lives according to that love and the courage to be faithful disciples who believe and follow the way of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
that you would hear our concerns as well as our thanksgivings. We pray
pray for the sick and the infected. God, help and heal. Sustain our bodies and our spirits. Teach us how we might contain the spread of illness and infection. We pray for vulnerable populations. God, protect our elderly and those suffering from chronic disease. Provide for the poor and especially for those whose health care comes at a cost they can't afford. God, we pray for the young and the strong. Give them the necessary caution to keep them from unwittingly spreading this disease and also inspire them to help. Lord, we pray for those with mental health challenges who feel isolated, anxious, helpless. Provide them with the support they spoke so desperately desire. Lord, we pray for the homeless, unable to practice social distancing in the system of shelters into which they have retreated. Protect them from disease. Help us provide isolation shelters in all places. We pray for workers in all industries who have been laid off or facing layoffs and financial hardships. Keep them from panic. Inspire your church to generously support them. We pray for families with young children at home for the foreseeable future. God help mothers and fathers to together creatively care for their children and for their nourishment. And for single mothers and single fathers, may you grow their networks of support. For parents who cannot stay home from work but must find care for their children, May we help them find creative solutions. And for the brilliant and dedicated scientists who seek to understand this virus's nature, we pray that they may learn how to slow, how to prevent its spread, and to soften the suffering it brings. Thank you for doctors, nurses, and everyone from housekeepers to cooks, from dialysis and inhalation technicians to emergency room personnel who are truly risking their lives for the sake of us all. Bless, strengthen, keep them safe from all harm, and grant them rest when they need it. And for the many who now we call essential in our lives from grocery store clerks and managers, to dishwashers in restaurants, and so many more. Grant them protection and teach us to offer them unexpected appreciation and surprise them with recognition. May they not labor in shadows, but be seen as deeply appreciated heroines and hero heroes as they are. Forgive, enlighten, encourage repentance among the flippant and the careless, among the heedless and malicious, among the it can't happen to me folks of all ages. Give us more common sense. Help us to think beyond our own convenience, our own risks, our own losses. Help us to think about the least of these, our sisters and brothers, who are vulnerable in ways we really now can comprehend. And Lord, help us to think wisely about ourselves and how we might be the people you created us to be, loving and loved, thoughtful and wise, confident and open to all. All this, all these, we pray in the name of our Lord who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Every day. 